Take your Bibles. Turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter number 9. 1 Samuel chapter number 9. When we look in God's Word, we find in, by way of just dividing things up, if you will, we begin to study the life of Saul from chapter 9 to chapter 15. And uh, Saul, I mean, uh, Israel has demanded a king. And uh, they've been warned by the Lord, remember, in chapter number 8, of all that this king's going to do to them. The prophet, the man of God has told him, he's going to take from you, in verse 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 and 18 of chapter 8. And the word in verse number 19 of chapter 8 that stands out as the people say, nevertheless. <laughs> nevertheless, the people refuse to obey. And they say, nay, but we will have a king over us. Stubborn people. And so, they got a king. They're going to get a king, and his name's going to be Saul, and his name's going to mean, isn't this interesting, asked for. <laughs> Saul's name means asked for. And they're going to get what they asked for <laughs> in Saul. And God will give you what you asked for. We've been looking at that. And we find Saul here. We're going to try to study this whole chapter. We're going to try we find Saul here doing his father's business. His father's name is Kish. And the Bible says that he goes out looking for his father's lost asses or donkeys. And you find that there in verse number 3. And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to Saul his son, Take now one of the servants with thee and arise and go seek the asses. And he passed through the Mount Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found them not. Then they passed through the land of Shalim, and there were not. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. And when they were come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, let us return. Let's go back. Lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. And he said unto him, Behold, now there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man, and all that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, preaventure. He can show us our way that we should go. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? And the servant said, answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver that will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. This is a little note from the Holy Ghost in parentheses. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spoke, spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. And they went unto the city where the man of God was. And as they went up to the hill, up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water and said unto them, Is the seer here? And they answered them and said, He is. Behold, he is before you. Make haste now, for he has come today to the city. For there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. My mind has to wonder why they were sacrificing. Maybe it set in too late. That they were stubborn and sinful and didn't listen. As soon as ye become, in, as soon as ye become into the city, ye shall straightway find him. Before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come, because he doth bless the sacrifice. And afterwards they eat that, he, that be bidden. Now therefore get you up, for about this time you shall find him. And they went up into the city. And when they were come into the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. 
This is a key verse. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people, because their cries come, up, come unto me. And when Samuel saw, saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake, to thee of. This same shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up bef before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let thee go, and I will tell thee all that is in thine heart. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, Set not thy mind on them, for they are found, and on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? And Saul answered and said, I am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin. Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor, and made them to sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about thirty persons. And Samuel said unto the cook, Bring the portion which I have gave thee, of which I said unto thee, set it by thee. And the cook took up the shoulder, and that which was upon it, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Behold that which is left, set it before thee, and eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And when they were come down from the high place into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. And they rose up early. And it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out both of them, he and Samuel, abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we need your help tonight to preach this wonderful chapter in your word. I pray that We'd behold wondrous things out of your word tonight. I pray you'd speak to us, teach us your word. Preach to us what needs to be preached. Write it on our hearts. And give us something to leave. Give us something tonight that we can leave with to apply to our lives. Help your dear people tonight to be edified and strengthened in the inner man and comforted by the word of God and the scripture. And may... Uh, May you just revive us tonight in some way. We need you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to preach a little while tonight when you think you're just looking for donkeys. When you think you're just looking for donkeys. That's what Saul was doing. He was just looking for donkeys. Now let me be clear about one thing. Saul was not God's choice or first choice. Saul was not the man that God would have chosen. It was in God's providence that he was there. But God had better for his own people. And many times God has better for us and better for a country but we say, nevertheless, we'll have it our own way. And that's where we're at in chapter nine, number 9. And I see in this passage of Scripture God's providence. God's providence simply means the amazing way God supervises and supersedes all things to provide for His people. I can't believe what's going on here. I mean, the, the details of this account... And all that goes on, the more I think about it, the more I'm just mesmerized by God's sovereignty and God's provision. 
God is not only working in Saul's life in a special way, he's working in everybody else's life in a special way. There's all kinds of characters. There's little maidens here, young ladies. There's a servant. There's Samuel. There's Saul. And then there's the whole nation of Israel. You you want to concentrate on chapter 9 like it's just Saul. Well, that's not the case. A bunch of other people involved. Looky here. You think you've got something going on, and you do. And you're something going on looking for donkeys for your daddy. You're something going on that you've got going on. It's not just about you. It's about lots of other people that touch you while you're going through what you're going through. God's got a lot of things connected to your life. and God's got a lot of things connected to my life, and it's just not about me. You see how many things touched Saul as he's going through this? I'm telling you, our God is involved in everything that goes on. Saul wasn't a perfect man. I think God was giving Saul an opportunity to do the right thing. I think Samuel was giving Saul the opportunity to do the right thing, be a good king, right? Oh, I just want to say something right here. I just get ahead of myself. I think it's beautiful that Samuel is not bitter at God. You don't see any tinge of that. Why are you letting Israel get what they want? Why is Saul this man? He's not a God-fearing man. He doesn't even know me. The servant knows about Samuel, but Saul doesn't know, right? Right? Think about it. There's no bitterness at all. There's no grudge held by Samuel. There's no evil spirit held by Samuel. I think it's a beautiful thing as you see things transpire. I don't know how I can say this, but Holy Spirit, help me to say it right. I think it's a beautiful thing when people know better like Samuel. And Samuel knew better about Saul and the situation. And he knew the people weren't in the situation they ought to be in. He still didn't get bitter at God and bitter at the next man coming down the pipeline. Who knows what I'm talking about? Say amen. To keep a sweet spirit through it all. That's what I see out of Samuel. But I think Samuel had to learn what we all have to learn. Trust God's providence. Trust God's plan. God was working in Saul's life, Samuel's life, the nation's life. He was working in everybody's life. God was orchestrating people to be in certain places, the young maidens, the servants, the servant, all to be in the right place at the right time for Samuel to be with Saul in the end of chapter number 9 and Saul to be chosen as king and anointed king in chapter number 10. And God will give us Uh, Those same opportunities as well. He works in our churches, our homes, and our cities, and even our country in a providential way. God is in every detail. And just like, I don't know, just like (laughs) Saul is chasing or looking for donkeys. Sometimes life can get frustrating. Sometimes life looks like we're chasing donkeys and never getting to them. We're looking for donkeys but never getting anywhere. Every, every, t- every, t- every time I think about that right there, the only book I think about is Ecclesiastes. Sometimes life is like finding donkeys that are in a wilderness. And you never can get to them. Uh, you know, half of y'all probably in here know about the times that we had to chase pigs around our property. That's a circus. And sometimes life's that way too. You feel like you're getting nowhere, you can't get nowhere, you get get close to the pig's foot and where you can grab him and hold on to him and he slips right through your hand. Sometimes life's that way too. And that's that's what this is a picture of right here. But God's in all the details. While you're running around, you would be over here. But you're over yonder over here and God got you over there so he could do something greater in your life. As Dr. Sexton would say, remember in life, this is for that. This is for that. You might be going through a this, but it's for that later. 
and maybe only heaven will reveal what that was for, but this is for that, and there'll be another this for that, another this for that, and God connects all the peoples and connects all the dots, and the just shall live by faith. Say amen, church. I can't figure out how all the dots connect, but somehow God connects them all. Chasing and looking for donkeys. Life is more than looking for donkeys, though. You got to look past the donkeys and see God's hand in it all. Samuel knew some background stuff. Saul didn't. <laughs> I want to notice a few things tonight. I want to notice, first of all, God's got in hand. God's got in hand. A very ordinary and frustrating thing goes on. Saul is looking for his daddy's asses or donkeys in verse 3. They're lost. He tells a servant to go with them. And God's guiding hand to get Saul where he needed to be in his plan was for his daddy to say to his boy, go look for my lost donkeys. God is at work in, number one, in interruptions and setbacks. God is at work in through his guiding hand and interruptions and setbacks. The asses are lost in verse 3. They look in all these cities that are named here in verse 4 and they can't find them. Saul gets to the place where he's frustrated and says, let's just hang it up. My dad might even forget about us. We've been gone so long we don't even have any bread left. Didn't they say that? So they didn't look at him for, they didn't look for, him, uh, for just a couple hours. They looked for him long enough that they didn't have any food. He was sent off on some sort of fruitless mission looking for lost donkeys in a hill country of Ephraim. He and his servant go up and down the hillsides and can't find them anyway, anywhere. He's just looking for donkeys. But God's guiding hand was at work the whole entire time. Let me tell you something, friend. Sometimes life looks like looking for donkeys that you never can find. What are we doing in this wilderness? What are we doing in this land? Are we come, is anything coming to fruition? Seems like I'm chasing my own tail sometimes. No, I'm talking about myself. Like what are we doing? What do we have to show for? Life just sometimes is that way. When you raise children, it looks that way. Hello, say amen. When you raise children, am I getting anywhere with these hard-headed kids? I love y'all so, so much. Did your children, you ever know what I'm talking about with that right there? And then God will bring you some, bring some good, good, good tokens in your life and remind you it's not in vain. But many times it's like herding cats or chasing donkeys, amen? It's that way in a church sometimes. You preach and you hope you're preaching in love, but it feels like you're just looking for some donkeys and there's 500 acres and it's all woods and you're just going around in circles. But God has you do all that to put you in a certain place in His providence and in His will. God's always at work. He's at work in the setbacks and the interruptions. He had His servant and Saul in the perfect place to fulfill His perfect will. I don't know how I could elevate Saul. Let me tell you, I don't know how we can elevate any of the Bible characters. The Bible is about, not about David. The Bible's not about Abraham. The Bible's not about Moses. The Bible's not about Paul. The Bible is about a sovereign God who is perfect. That'd be a good place to say amen. If I was sitting there, I'd say amen. I think that'd be God's will to say amen. The Bible is about a sovereign God who is perfect. It's not about David. Was David a sinner? Was Moses a sinner? Was Paul a sinner? A little hesitant there on that one. Yeah, he was a sinner. Was Joseph a sinner? But it was God behind those men that worked all things together for good. It's a perfect God that plans all things out. I'm not here to lift up men. I, I wouldn't definitely lift up Saul, but he's just a sinner like everybody else. Amen? But he is found doing what he ought to be doing. Let me tell you something to young people or to all of us. It's God's will to do what your daddy asks you to do. It's God's will for you to obey your parents and honor your parents in all things, for this is right. And Saul was on the right page in chapter number 9. When his daddy asked him to go do something, he went and did it. 
I will say this. Something's the matter. He wanted to go back home awful quick. Sounds like our generation, doesn't it? Wanted to go back awful quick. But thank God, I'm just preaching. Now, I'm not even looking at my notes. It's, this story's just bubbling up in me so much, I'm just going to preach. But praise God for servants, amen, that know the man of God and keep on saying to the young souls, hey, no, don't go back home. Hey, no, we got something for the man of God to give them. We got a little bit of change in our pockets. Hey, he, he's the man of God. We need to keep going. Hey, your daddy told you to do something, and he uh, sent me with you to do it, so we're going to do it. And that's a picture of obeying God, by the way, our Heavenly Father. Let's get together. Hey, two are better than one, amen, and let's get together. And if God, our Heavenly Father's given us something to do, stop making excuses, and let's do it for the glory of God. Hallelujah. That's what you got to do. That's what I see in here. Saul was at least doing the right thing. You can apply that to your heavenly father, obeying him. And young people, you can apply that to obeying your mama and your daddy. God will bless that. But God's in the interruptions and the setbacks. And God is at work. Listen, talk about God's guiding hand. God's at work in the people he places in your life. When I say that, my heart gets tender. Verse 5, when they were come in the land of Zuth, Saul said to the servant that was with him, Come, let us return. Let my father leave care of the asses. And take thought, let my, let my, lest my father leave caring for the asses, and take thought for us. And he said unto him, Behold, there's, there is in this city a man of God. The servant says, No, let's keep going. And then Saul says, as we've already read, we don't have any money for him. We can't give him anything. We're out of bread. And the servant says in verse number 8, Behold, I have here at my at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver that will, that will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. So let's keep at it. And then they keep going a little bit more and they run into these young maidens who give them direction to where the man of God is. So what are you saying? God puts people in our lives to direct us where we need to be going. Oh, you've got a pastor. You've had preachers. You've had parents. We have elder saints of God in this congregation that can guide us along life's way. God puts people into our lives to guide us where we need to be for the next step. Now, I can remember when I was in Bible college... And I don't think I'd be standing here. I have no confidence that I'd be standing in this pulpit as a 38-year-old man being your pastor if I didn't have this divine appointment. I was leaving Crown College. I was a senior. And I'd planned to come to church. Bemis Road Baptist Church had agreed for me to help here. And I was leaving Crown College. And Brother Scott Pauley ran into me in the hallway. Now, if you meet Brother Scott Pauley, met Brother Scott Pauley at Crown College, he was the busiest nice man you'd ever met. If you saw him in the hallway, about all you got, unless you got an appointment with him, was, hey, how you doing? Right on by. He was just going to the next place. He wasn't a jerk or rude. He was just busy. And that's all you got from him. Unless you had an appointment, he'd sit down and talk with you. Well, we met in the hallway a couple days left in school. I don't know how many. and It was just one of those, hey... And he stopped me. He said, Brother Justin, what you planning on doing when you leave here? I said, well, I plan on going to April's home church, to Bemis Road Baptist Church, and uh, serving them for a couple years, and then going to go plant a church in Arkansas. Some of you might have never heard this before. And I said, I really want to plant a church in Arkansas. Church planning is on my heart. And I said, I just kind of train there for a couple years and then go plant a church. He said, that sounds great. He said, there's only one problem with that. He said, you go to Bemis Road Baptist Church like you're going to stay there all your life. And if God tells you to leave Bemis Road Baptist Church and go plant a church in Arkansas, then go start a church. But don't do a disservice to those people that are gods and shortcut them and whenever the road gets rough, what you'll end up doing is leaving because you've already got in your mind 
leaving. You wouldn't be upset if I told you I'd been already gone if I'd have had that mindset. Because ministry's hard. I'd been gone the first couple of years. That's no offense. A few dear saints that are here, you understand that, amen? But tough, tough stuff gets hard. If he would have never, no, if God would have never appointed us to be together for maybe three minutes to have a conversation, I don't believe I'd stand here behind this pulpit to be your pastor. God is in control of little conversations. You know, God's not just control. He, he's, 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 he's interested in what goes on behind a sacred desk, amen? But he can use a conversation that Brother Buddy has with Paul Jr. and with what Brother Ray Griner speaks to my boy, Jackson Atchison. What Brother Sprom says to Paul Hinkle. What Aunt Liz says, oh, you understand, I don't have to go across and make a web, do I? Do you believe God can order our, our words and our steps and our conversations and then even outside this place as well? God is sovereign. I see that in my life. It's not a story of us. It's not a story of the saints. It's the story of God working out His purposes in our lives. And that's what happens here. You see the setbacks, God's guiding hands. You see the people around us, God's guiding hand. And then you see the timing of events, God's guiding hand. Look at verse 11. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water. And said unto them, Is the seer here? And they answered him and said, He is here. Behold, he is before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city, for there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. The timing's perfect. If they had arrived one day earlier, it would have been one day too soon, right? Isn't that special? Well, sometimes you've got to say what Dr. Max Alderman says. It's not odd. It's God. Get that in your old noggin. It's not odd, it's God. And in your life, it's the same way. There's things if it was a day earlier, but it wasn't a day earlier because God directs the steps of a good man. He knew the exact time, the exact place Saul and the servant needed to be to be with those young ladies. And let me tell you something. At this point, in Saul's frustration, he's shot. All, what's all he thinking about? Somebody tell me. What's all on his mind? Say it real loud like you actually came to listen tonight. Donkeys is all he's thinking about. Sometimes in life all we're thinking about is donkeys. But we got to recognize donkeys are secondary and God is primary. Yeah, they're going to have donkeys to deal with. And by the way, I don't think you're my donkeys, amen. I don't think my children are my donkeys. It's just things that we have to do. Things God's given us to do. But look past that and see God working all those things out. The exact time, the exact place, all worked out. I jotted something down, tried to word it right. When life's timing seems off, it might be on. When life's timing seems off, it just might be on God's timing. Because we're not to live by sight, we're to live by faith. I want everything to go on my time. I like to spin things around so they make sense to a congregation from my life. I was so frustrated the last week, I couldn't get Dr. David Gibbs to come to the Jubilee. I'd set my heart on it. Honest, I'd set my heart on it. I'd called him and called him and called him. God's my witness. I must have talked to somebody at the CLA six times. I saw him at Southwide. I even brought my beautiful daughter to meet him and everything like that. And I said, we're going to get Dr. Gibbs here. I was excited about Dr. Gibbs coming. He calls me, Curtis, and says, I can't come. Will you schedule me for 2015? Sure, I'd love to. That's exactly what I wanted, sir. You know, I want to, uh, 2000, 2025, excuse me, 2025? I, and I smiled. I said, sure. I said, now what am I going to do? I really wanted a good keynote speaker. 
And you don't have to understand all that. So I get on the phone. The next morning I said, well, I'll just call Kenny Baldwin. I had a list of preachers that I wanted to come. I call Kenny Baldwin up. He picks up the phone. You don't have to understand that, but that's rare in itself. He picks up the phone. Calls me back five minutes later. Says, you won't believe it. I've got to come back from Pensacola. I preach at Pensacola Christian College Friday morning. I've got to come back. And I've got to stop somewhere. I I like preaching, so I might as well preach at your Jubilee. I said, perfect. I said, God's in it for sure. Then, as I was in the process, I had contacted Don Farmer. Already. And he calls me a few mornings later. I'm over at the radio station. He said, you still want me to come to the Jubilee? (laughs) I said, Lord, I guess we'll have two of them. So he's coming. God, that's small. That's my life. But I'm just telling you, I thought I had my way of doing things. And God says, no, I'll do what I want to do. And I'm telling you, I'm good with it. Amen. God's way is always better. And that's the same way for your life. Let me tell you another thing. I think God's helping some people right now. I don't give a lot of personal illustrations. I try to preach the text. But maybe this is helping you a little bit. You heard this on the radio already. I'm sorry. Me and April have that brown van. Who's seen our big brown van? Oh, yeah. We needed to get a new van right after the twins were born. The A-team. That's exactly right. We had to get a new van. We couldn't really fit in a regular minivan, so... We had to get some sort of transit or NV, so we chose we're going to get an NV. Miss Doris, we found one in Atlanta. It was sharp. Boy, I was proud to be driving this bus around if I was going to get it. It was an NV, had the chrome wheels on it. I think it had the bull guard on the front, had the, had the step guards on the side. It was the V8 motor. I mean, it was sharp. It had the navigation system in it. It had the DVD players in it. Me and my friend Randy are going to drive up and go get it. In Atlanta, I get to about exit 200 to call the dealership, and they said, we sold it underneath you. Oh, I felt so spiritual and so saved at that moment. I said to myself, oh, boy, I've driven all the way up here, took somebody with me. I said, well, the next best thing to do right now, Randy, is go to Waffle House. So we get to Waffle House and food, uh, just, didn't, you know, just settle down a little bit. And I said, oh, man. And I, you know, I had to call him back and just let my frustrations out. I didn't lose my testimony. I said, you sold it underneath me. I told you I was coming to get it. We're sorry, sir. Somebody, another salesman sold it, and I was your salesman. I didn't flag it, and he sold it. Well, I guess that's not what God wanted me to have, but I still don't like it. You ever been there before? Oh, yeah, you've been there before, be honest. Well, that van was sharp and everything, but... Brother Buddy, it had 110,000 miles on it. And God gave us the cheap model that we're driving right now. The V6, the cloth seats and not the leather seats. No DVD players and a navigation screen about this big. No, no, nothing special. And it, it, it's fine. God's meeting our needs. I'm not complaining. And I'm driving it the other day, Brother Hinkle. And I said, if I would have got what I wanted, I wouldn't even still be driving that van. Because it'd probably have almost 200,000 miles on it. See what I'm talking about? And this thing, wherever this thing's at, this thing only has 80,000 miles on it. And it hasn't caused us a bit of trouble. See what I'm talking about? God's ways are always better. God's timing's always perfect. Say, what in the world about that's God's timing? God said, I'll be good to you, young man. I'll have somebody buy it underneath you just in the nick of time before you get there on the lot 30 minutes away. God's guiding hand. That's all carnal and frivolous and not very spiritual. But don't you think God's all, all in the details of your life? He certainly is. God's guiding hand. Now, God gives them a backstage pass. That is, Samuel and us, a backstage pass. After his guiding hand in verse 14, you have God's backstage pass. At least that's what I called it. In verses 15 to 17, where Samuel gets the details about Saul. 
and how he's going to anoint him. That's the day before. See the day before in verse 15? That's God's backstage pass. You know, I want to tell you something, friends. I, I tell you something. The backstage pass for us is not until heaven. We're not made to understand God or figure out His plans. Sorry. We're not made to understand God or figure out His plans. We're made to live by faith and not by sight. For without faith it is impossible to please God. Now I wish I could tell you something different. It would kind of make me feel important. But my God's perfect. He does all things well. And I can tell you this. He's trustworthy. You can hold to His unchanging hand and He'll never let you down. But we're going to get a backstage pass, brothers and sisters. Farther along, we'll understand it better by and by when we see Jesus. Now, I know I can't finish this passage of Scripture properly. But in verses 18 through 24, not only do you see God's guiding hand and God's backstage pass, but you see divine appointments, God's divine appointments. It's a divine appointment that God has set for Samuel and Saul. Samuel says something here. Where is it now? I've lost my place here. In verse 20, I think. <laughs> and as for the asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> he said, that's nothing to worry about. We got, we got bigger things going on than the donkeys. Let me tell you something, friend. That's our God. He'll use the donkeys to take your mind. He'll use the donkeys to get you from here to yonder. To get you where he needs you to be. But it's not about the donkeys. It's about God's perfect will for your life. It's not about, don't set your mind on that. Can we see past the donkeys? Stop worrying about the donkeys. And see God in the midst of all. God, see God's hand in all of it. God's plan is always better than yours. You think you got a great plan, and you might have a good plan, but I promise you God's plan is better than your plan, and God's timing is better than your timing, and God's will will satisfy you. You'll be happy if you live each day in the center of God's will. He's just better all around, everything about him. Delight thyself also in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now I know, and I look at you honestly as your pastor, that was a terrible verse-by-verse -verse exposition of 1 Samuel chapter number 9. But maybe you'll remember it. Something about those donkeys and how God used those donkeys to get Saul where he needed to be to Samuel. And all the other characters that were connected to it. And maybe you can think about your life after we leave here in a little while and see how God's hand was in it all. There is, what are we saying? An unseen hand that leads us along.